Welcome to the Africa Podcast. Today is another episode of Quarter Tones, but we have a very special episode because we are recording live here. Um, with me is Pithug, who is one half of the musical duo Chromio, who's born in Lebanon and has done many things, including being the founder of the Habibi Market. P, welcome to Africa. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Man, it's so cool because um, we were just saying that we've been planning on doing this for a while. Yeah. We were saying we, we want to do it online. And now we get to do it. Long real. It's better. It's better. In real life, in Beirut. Um, in, in this, in this uh, vibe that I'm having right now, the, the, the return, to, return yeah. to Lebanon. Super Ras Beiruti vibe. Yeah. Um, what are your immediate memories? Like you're stuck in traffic, you're coming to my apartment in Hamra. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's your, what has this experience been like? Uh, it's been a roller coaster of emotions, to say the least. Um, I was, um, I'm gonna, you know, give out my age, but I was born in 1977 um, here in uh, Zal'an at Hôpital uh, Arez. <laughs> and it, so that was during the war. And um, so I lived here for the first eight years of my life. Then I left for Egypt. My mom is Egyptian, so I'm, I'm Le- Lebanese born here. My father's Lebanese, my mom's Egyptian. We left for Egypt for a couple of years before moving to Canada, um, where I did my high school and university. And the last memories of me coming here was in 1998, because we left and then once, once the war finished, uh, we came back a couple of times to see some family and some stuff. Um, the last time I had come back after the war was 1991 and then 1996 and then 1998 was the last mm-hmm. time where I had an issue with with the military service. They picked me up at the airport. Yeah. So I spent a week there in 1998. I was that, that, that's the fresh. Have that. Yeah. <laughs> I was on the plane ready to leave. Yeah. They picked me up, stopped the plane, took my suitcase out. Yeah, I don't know. So after that, I was, I made a little blockage and I was like, you know, I need to focus on my life, my career. I was already sort of, you know, I had my vision already that I wanted to be in music, make music, be an artist. Um, and I knew I couldn't risk, you know, and back then the, the, the military service was still mandatory. Yeah. I think until 2004. Right. Yep. So I was like, I'm, I'm, that's it. I gave my childhood to the country and I'm not going to give my adulthood for, for that. So, yeah. So how long did it <clears throat> stay in your head as a place that is blocking your progress to a place that maybe isn't part of your progress, but at least isn't actively disrupting who you want to be? It's, it's part of my progress. It's part of who I am, you know? Yeah coming back here and, and seeing all these sights and sounds and remembering, you know, the beautiful chaos that unfortunately sometimes is too much chaos. Um, but it's definitely part of who I am. It made me who I am within the music, even though I don't reference Arabic music in what I do, the energy is there. For sure. The angst is there, the, you know, the aggression is, funk is an aggressive music. Yeah. It's disguising jazz and, and softness with aggression, you know? Yeah, it's literally with a slap of a bass. Exactly. You're literally slapping something. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So, so it has a lot to do with, you know, who I am as a person and w- what, what I put into my music, uh, you know, listening to rap music since I was, you know, since I, I moved to Canada, that was the first thing I was interested in. Um, were you like an aggressive kid? Were you an angry kid when you got there? Um, I was, no, but uh, there, there was aggression, but you learn how to manage as a young kid mm. when you see things um, that you see in, in, in those circumstances, in the circumstance of war, you, you understand pretty quick how, how violent humans can be. And you grow up really quick in those conditions, you grow up really quick. I, I remember thinking like an adult, you know, at eight years old, 10 years old, 
like okay this is life you know yeah shit halak this is yeah shit halak so so no you know you you people people do what they want with it you know some people it makes them aggressive and some people understand and they go away from it you know um i chose the other route and maybe especially because you know my father was a was a militia and he got shot during uh during the war and that's wow. why we left so there was a lot, we weren't uh, you could live in lebanon away from the war we didn't yeah we were i was right in the middle of it my father came home every night with a you know oh crap yeah with a machine gun so um, how much of i mean was he okay yeah yeah he survived yeah how much of that like did you take with you to canada i mean it's like uh, you can leave everything. the war does the war leave you everything you take everything um like i said you grew up really quick you yeah. know you grew up really quick in those circumstances so yeah you know so you you moved to canada you go to the public school system or you go to just a normal canadian school yeah um and yeah, i started in the public school system over there yeah yeah are you surrounded by and then French i went Canadian? to and then i went to f- a french lycée of course because yeah all children of french colonies in montreal and abroad mostly their parents want to you know keep want the them French to go there. in the same system so are they are you entering into a, a super uh, diverse community of immigrants from the caribbean and from uh from yeah. lebanon and africa and stuff like that this or? this is what the second part of what made me who i am and why i do what i do today you move somewhere completely new luckily I'm, i don't want to say i spoke the language because french canadian is very different yeah Right. Uh, it took me a while to I remember as a kid it took me a while to to adapt to to the French Canadian because I spoke Arabic and French and that was you know it, but it was the French from here yeah French from the French school and then you get to Montreal and it's completely different um so it takes a bit of adapting but like I said as as soon as you go you go in and and there's always like a a class d'accueil they call it right so they you move to Canada you get your papers they want to make sure you speak French they put you in a, like a welcome sort of orientation know, orientation school like okay he speaks good French you can do this blah blah blah, blah etc so I go to public school for uh the first couple of years <clears throat> and of course at that time there weren't many uh Lebanese or even Arabs in general um the immigration started a little bit after but the communities were so split up that each literally each neighborhood and each school was different uh in my school I gravitated I gravitated towards you know rap music the Haitian community um the uh Moroccans Jewish Moroccans, Moroccan, like, you know, all of that stuff. I grew up around that because of the proximity. Got very involved in the rap scene. <clears throat> um, and that's how I started. Because rap was the first music I really listened to. Fresh off the boat, I land, uh, land in Montreal. The first years I'm awakened to music and buying my own music. I buy Michael Jackson and LL Cool J. Yeah. Those were my two first records that I bought with my money. So. Which LL Cool J album? Hmm? Which LL Cool J album? Bad. <laughs> Michael Jackson bad and LL, LL Cool J bad. <laughs> you're like, you go to the A- B section yeah. and you're just like, yeah. I want both of them. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> yeah, bad, so, aka bigger and deafer. So uh, I'll ask you, what is the first hip hop song that you knew every lyric to? It was LL Cool J bad. Yeah, yeah. All the way through. Yeah, all the way through. So funny. Mine is Warren G Regulate for sure. Oh, okay. Gen- okay, generation <laughs> after. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um I knew the lyrics for that too. <laughs> what in your household would have sort of prepared you for sonically prepared you for those jazz inspired nothing. <laughs> nothing. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. At home was 
anti-art <laughs> and anti, you know, actively anti. -art. Not actively, but it was it was not a, 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 a house of philosophers and artists, mm. you know. Yeah, it was it was a house of if you know just family traditional family Arabic music and French music. French music that you know my mother and father would listen to in the fifties here. Yeah, fifties and six sixties. You know, was it an act of a re of rebellion? Were you sort of like a closeted rap fan at home? No, no, no. Like it was walking it was... in with a baggy pants, sagging your pants, and it's like, <laughs> pick up your pants. Yeah, yeah. Was that... <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, it, it it wasn't an act of rebellion. You know, it was. Of course, when my you know my father would confront me with the earrings and the baggy pants, I'd be like, whatever, you know. Yeah. But inside, like most of it was, this is who I am. Yeah. You're gonna accept it or not, you know. And like I said, you're an adult at ten years old when you known and and have seen, you know, and lived this type of environment. So I knew right away that. I, it was going to be my way or nothing. Yeah. So I was like, you're going to accept the long hair. You're going to accept the earrings. You're going to accept the baggy pants. I'm not going to bother you with my music. I'm not going to be an idiot. You know, I'm not going to go out and do drugs and, and do dumb stuff. But this is culturally, this is going to be me from yeah. now on, you know. And if I ask the, <clears throat> sort of the 16 year old version of you. Yeah. Uh, who you really look up to musically. Um, you, you've mentioned a few names, but in my experience when I was a kid, there, were, there was music I loved, but there's also people I admired, and they weren't always ex exactly. Ex yeah, 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 that's true. So yeah. who did you admire as a kid, musically? I really admired um, KRS-One. Yeah, the professor. Yeah, yeah. KRS-One, Public Enemy, NWA, uh, so everybody with a message, uh, you know, and... And you're asking about violence. I lived my violence as a child, and then I spit it out with rap music, with you know, gangster rap, yeah, and stuff like that. This is how I came out because you can, you know, you can grow up and be mature, but it still stays inside of you. you yeah. Know? So you have to release it somehow, and that's where music comes in, and you know, listening to, and then also. As I'm growing up and I'm discovering music, musical instruments, then rap comes meshed in. And I was actually a closeted heavy metal listener yeah, for a while of, because speaking of aggression. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, because in back in those days, you were one or the other. Yeah, it wasn't could, eclectic like 100%. today. You know, so you grew up in a certain community. You you dress a certain way, but nobody could know that I was listening to Metallica and and Megadeth and. You yeah, know? so every now and then you'd you'd find out like somebody loved corn or a Slipknot, yeah, and you'd be yeah. like, "What?" Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, when did you first start playing? So as I'm discovering, as I'm going, you know, a bit older, 14, 14 years old, fifteen yeah. years old. Um, by then, I'm in a French uh, lycée in Montreal, and I'm slowly like, I'm already secretly a Metallica fan, and I see the kids with the long hair and sometimes I and then I'm like <laughs> oh, I like this song and then I go in you know and yeah. start listening to music and then I discover you know Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, uh, Santana, Bob Marley and from then on I get interested in how rap was a certain type of production and and, and the other stuff was different. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay, they make this with instruments. They make this with samplers, you know? And I get curious and I start playing guitar. So I discovered playing guitar. Um, What's the first guitar you owned? My first, the first guitar I owned was a PV Predator. <laughs> nice. $150. My father refused to buy me any instruments ever. Yeah. So. And I, I worked at my parents, uh, and this is how Habibi comes in also. I worked at, as soon as we moved to Canada, of course, you know, you see the immigrants, they have the corner store and, the you know. The basically. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm that kid working behind the cash at 10 years old, closing the accounts and make, making orders at 12 years old. Yeah. Everybody thinks I'm a woman. They can't believe a 12-year-old is calling them to order 
three kilos three kilos of potatoes and carrots for Monday morning <laughs> because we need to do like you know uh, potato salad and tabbouleh. We had started like it, that was you know back in the late eighties and people in Canada didn't know Lebanese food. They didn't even know what coffee Turkish coffee or even espresso was. Yeah. So we show up there and we're making them tabbouleh and. People are like, oh, well, this is very interesting. Oh, you guys are like uh, herbivores, they called us. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Were you always a, um, this like multidimensional creative? I mean, it's funny, like when I first reached out to you, um, I hadn't even put it together <clears throat> that you, you're the person behind Yahibiba Market, which is this highly visual, um, beautifully designed and executed brand, right? Mm. Um, and then it started to make sense to me because Chromio sonically is super interesting and rich and textured and layered. Yeah. Um, but you've won awards, like you've literally been recognized for the visuals as much as yeah. the, as the, yeah. the audio. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so if I met the, the young version of you, were you also interested across all the board, uh, across the different sort of media of uh, creative um, expression? Yes, absolutely. And all these things for me go hand in hand. Yeah. And you're asking how, you know, how, how did, how does your, your culture and your, your childhood here affect you in, in the way you work? It, it, it does in those ways. You just go out the street here, there's sounds, there's smells, there's loud pictures and, and visuals everywhere. And when you don't have that all of a sudden, because North America is very different, you know, when you don't have that all of a sudden, you need to recreate it. Yeah. Because it's part of you. So you need all of these, and it's probably something physical. You need all, all of these, you know, uh, um, stimuli, stimuli to, to grab you all the time or else you get bored or you you veer into something you know a bit dark because you know you have to to face the fact that years of growing up like this that it doesn't go unnoticed on your system and and on your on your psyche so the things you develop as a child to forget about all this stuff outside you're gonna need that for the rest of your life. So for me, it's a it's a constant grabbing on to elements and stimuli, to to like <clears throat> it's it's uh, until today. So it's it sounds like it could be one of two things, and I I'm, I don't understand yet what it is. Yeah. But on one, it could be that it's like I've numbed my feelings so much, so I don't like try to relive the idea that my dad might not come home at night. Yeah. Right. And so. In or order that to, I might not make it. Or that you might not make it, right? And so in order to feel something, I have to recreate intense intensity in my yeah, feelings. Yeah, exactly. Does that sound that sounds right? Yeah, that's that's accurate. Because the other the other option is um, the intensity that all of a sudden I'm like, I live in this very sterile, safe environment. Yeah. And so And then you lose you lose it completely. Yeah. You lose it's uh, it's terrifying. Yeah, it's terrifying because you don't need those things that you're so used to having to, you know, and then you, you don't have the roller coaster anymore. You get addicted to the roller coaster. Yeah. You know, and this is why still today I come back after 25 years and I'm like, I'm enjoying this. You know, this is especially now that it's it's uh, less dangerous per se. It's as messed up, but less dangerous. And you grab on, you get right on the roller coaster, and you're like, I missed this, you know? Yeah. I missed this, yeah. Chromio, synth pop, funk duo, um, highly visual, super dancey, <clears throat> very funky. Um, I have so many questions about the duo as a structure, right? Because any creative project, it's really hard to work in collaboration. And when it's only two people, the nature of that collaboration has to be really, really special. Yeah. That's been an experience. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about how you met Dave and what the nature of that collaboration was then and what it is now. 
I would say it's pretty much the same still. So we met in high school. I had started playing instruments and I was starting to mesh my hip, hip hop background with this new, like, you know, musical instrument world that I was getting into, like live bands and live music, um, yeah. reggae, heavy metal, all of the above, everything else in hip hop. And I was starting to, to bridge gaps between, you know, be like, this rap song sounds like this sample from this band. And then you realize, oh, they took a piece of that, looped it, put some drums on it, and in my opinion, made it sound better, <laughs> you know? So I was always interested in discovering the roots of how you go from this to this. Yeah, and this is before whosampled.com. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yes, before the internet. Yeah, you're like, Aslam. you have to be like, I think this is Doobie Brothers. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Exactly. And that work is where I started really getting into the craft of discovering music, discovering funk, because I realized, yes, a lot of these, you know, sampled rock music, but most of it was funk music. Yeah. So my link was made from rap and I'm like, oh, I want to know more about this. Yeah. I love rock and roll. I love heavy metal. I love reggae. I love everything. But for me, it was... I wanted to get to the source of rap music. Yeah. And I started doing my study, my research. And this is where you lose yourself in that as much as you lose yourself practicing your instrument or designing a logo. <clears throat> so it was like a, a, a scholar, scholar's work. like Crate yeah, digging. and Crate digging. We started very young, me and Dave. We met in high school and we connected on... He came from a rock background. He came in when you came in with uh, G-Funk, Warren G, Regulator, that era, you know, a bit yeah. later. When Snoop Dogg became a big thing and then all of a sudden hip hop gets into, I wouldn't say mainstream, but it gets more. For sure, yeah. You know. Early 90s. Going early on. 90s, yeah. That's, that's the Beastie Boys era. Yeah. When everything started meshing together. Skaters were listening to rap music. Oh man, that was me. I was yeah. a skater. Yeah. I was right before that. Yeah. Um, so when this happens, so he also gets interested in funk music and we started collecting and going to record shops together every Saturday. Uh, and we would form a band also. And so we would go digging, go rehearse, figure out what funk and music is. And it was is. always just the two of you guys? You know, uh, like, uh, no, it was, uh, we, you know, we started in high school, so it was a high school band. We had a drummer. We had, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, you filled it out. And no yeah, he, I, was, he, I was the bass player. He was the guitar player. We had a drummer, keyboards. We, uh, but the central piece was always the two of us. Yeah. We switched people around us, and, um, and we just kept going with different bands throughout the years. Um, but I would say our... our Main thing was like discovering music together, the love of funk music. And culturally, we're very close too. So that for me was important. You know, yeah. he was from a Jewish uh, background. His mother's Moroccan. And, you know, you go to the hair house and it's just like my house. They're herbivores. <laughs> yeah, they're herbivores. Exactly. You know, so so that was that was uh, that was very important. Um, and part of what kept us together all this time is, you know, we have common goals, common interests, a common culture, and we just carry, you know. Yeah. And then after all this time, it becomes like a marriage, you know, you, you learn each other's, you know, strong and strengths and weaknesses and you sure. manage and you, it's, it's literally like a marriage. It's 25 years in a band is, most people don't survive that. Most people don't survive five years. In so you need a strong base. And I would say the strong base comes from, at the end of the day, <clears throat> we have the same principles about most things in life. Mm. And that's what carries you through, you know. Okay, I want to listen to one of your uh, songs, uh, earlier songs from the early 2000s, Fancy Footwork. Yeah. Um, so I'll play that's our first uh, sort of breakout. -y. Breakout, yeah. Not hit, but hipster breakout. Yeah. Okay, so like a song like this, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do you? How did you guys originally write it? So do you start? Are you like putting together a baseline 
uh, is it a so this sound one, bass heavy? Yeah, this one specifically. Heavy. This one, uh, I remember how every track was made. Uh, this one specifically. So sometimes I start a demo, and uh, I work alone. Sometimes I start a demo, make a bunch of demos, send them to him, and then he, if he likes it, he's gonna write lyrics mm -hmm. or a melody or something to it. Um, Sometimes we start together, sometimes he has ideas that he sings and I just voice them out on the piano and then we produce it together. It's always different. In this case, it happens to be, uh, it was one of my demos. I, I was still in Montreal at the time. I had a studio in my basement um, and I had come up with most of the, the drums, the bass line and the chords for the for the chorus what is your what is your litmus test your internal litmus test like the test to decide if something's worth sending to him cuz like you make i'm sure you make tons um, of stuff that just i have it. none you send everything everything really i have none there's there's needs to be like i said when you have a long and successful friendship and partnership you have to be able to be a, an open book, just like when you're married. You need a complete open book. Good to, ideas and bad ideas. Good ideas, bad ideas. Um, I don't care or, you know, or, or are ashamed of my bad ideas. And that's, that's literally how a couple is, you know? When there's a breakout hit like this, like you just said, um, like a hipster breakout, yeah. right? Is there any point where you get sick of playing the song, sick of talking about the song? Like, what the? Mishallah. Yeah. You know, at the time they're like, two step, two step. Yeah. And you're like, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sick of two step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did it ever get to that point? It, yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Uh, you know, but it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's part of. It's part of the game. It's part of the game. Yeah. It's part of the game. I know this song came out in 2007. We still play it today. I, yeah. You know, I'm, we're playing it. I know it by heart. So in my head, I'm doing accounting, you know, and I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm doing other stuff. Yeah. Because I just know it by heart. But seeing the people react to it is what makes, what makes it new every time. You know, it's funny. Whenever I see like these classic bands that have been together forever and they have hits from like decades gone by, yeah. right? I always think to myself, like the, the excitement levels must be high and then get super annoyed. Yeah. And then like so sick of the song. But then I think eventually they actually surpasses how it felt like way back. Yes, then. yeah, absolutely. So like now when you play the song, you're like, man, yeah. Such a classic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's exactly how it how it works. There's yeah, there was a curve where in 2012 I was like, okay, people still like this song. <laughs> you know, it's been out for five years. And then you're here 13 years later and whatever. And you're like, wow, people really like this song still today. Yeah. I guess it's a classic. And then you enjoy it and you see people react, still reacting to it. Yeah. And that's what makes it fun and interesting for you. Okay, I want to play another old one, um, relatively old one. Mm -hmm. uh, don't, turn your, don't Turn the Lights On. Don't Turn the Lights On. And the reason why I want to play this before, uh, before I do is because you guys were nominated for an award at the MTV VMAs for this. Yeah, for the video. Yeah. And so I, wanna, I want to know your relationship to well, videos. Video. I love it. Yeah. yeah. So let's play a little bit, then we'll talk about it. Okay, before we talk about the video. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> are you always, uh, do you come up with the bass lines mostly on a synth, generally? Yeah, you, uh, maybe, I would say 60, 70% of the time. Yeah. There's a lot of live bass lines too. Yeah. yeah. Music videos, it's hard to express to like a kid today how meaningful and important music videos were. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one question is, what is it like to attend the VMAs um, <laughs> and sort of be nominated yeah. uh, at a time where that really mattered a lot? Yeah, yeah, it did. Um, it did. So what was it like? Uh, it was great. It was great. It's uh, to get recognized for something else in the music is really actually super important and special to me. Um, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I love the multi levels of everything. It, things have to work visually, musically, artistically, you know, lyrically, everything has to mesh. For me, just music 
um, it, it's not enough. Yeah. I need the full, I need KISS. I need the theaters that go with it. You know, the theatrics that go with it. I need the visuals. I Michael need Jackson. Michael Jackson, you yeah. know, I need Madonna. I need Ki Prince. I need, you know, KISS. I need... Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know what I mean? I need Iron Maiden. I need loud stuff. Yeah. At all times. And so for me to be like, okay, people are recognizing our work outside of music, like the videos, uh, uh, the visuals, the artwork, you know, just the way we present ourselves, the way we dress, the way, you know, yeah. it's, it's super important. Presentation to me matters as much as the content. Yeah, so yeah, this, this video, like, what is the process of creating this type of thing? How does this match the, the point of the song? Are they completely two different elements that you guys just match together? Or are you like, this is my vision for the song because of what the song is about? Uh, it, we mostly leave that up to the, the video, the, the director. The and director, the... you know? Yeah. Yeah, we're like, what would you do with this? Cool. And we take pitches and whoever is, wh the important thing, um, the important thing really is humor in everything. It's Interesting. A, it's the levels. Same with the music. We have levels of humor, of nerdiness, of synth, you know, pure synth nerdiness, musical knowledge, stuff that we studied, you know, references, humor. Yeah. And then the sheen on top and then the presentation and then the videos, all of these things work together. And if there's no humor with videos, with music, with any of these aspects, it's not interesting to me. So you're basically putting Easter eggs throughout the song. Just little, yeah, Easter eggs everywhere. Videos, music, you know, everything, everything. And once you see a treatment from a director, and you find that one little bit of sense of humor that shows that little wink that shows that he he gets what you do, mm -hmm. then it's a good match. And then we just it's like carte blanche, you no. Know, yeah. Im impress us, make us laugh. Do you think about visuals that you guys create as a band differently mm -hmm. today mm -hmm. in the world of TikTok and Instagram that you did differently in the world of MTV? You know. TikTok is all about ADHD and yeah. just short spurts of, of satisfying your, your attention span, and, yeah. you know, which is, is a shame to me because you don't have time to develop a story um, or moments or it's always a short compensation, a short like release of, you know, yeah. um, there's no, it is what it is, but, but what bothers me the most is the quality. You know, I want to see something that's well put together. I understand that everything has to be like spontaneous and, and you know, on the spot now. Yeah. But there's something to say about, you know, taking a step back, working on your video, going through the details, making a craft of it, you know, rather than get quick views um, and then disappearing, you know. It's, uh, I think it's going to come back. When we first spoke, it was originally through Ya Habibi Market. Yeah. Right? Uh, which is very sort of Arab world leading, Arab world facing, yeah. front facing. Yeah. Right? It's, mm -hmm. first of all, the, the name is Arabic. Yeah. Um, and it's, has the uh, sort of a nostalgia to it. And that is like, Celebrating and clinging to a certain a certain past. Yeah, right? it's funny that when you and I first spoke You had said this to me um, That you know most people don't even know that I'm behind this. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, and it struck me as interesting because yeah. I, in Chromio Also, it's not immediately obvious. Oh, this is an Arab guy behind yeah. this guy's from Lebanon, right? Yeah, and he's behind Chromio. Yeah, and then, yeah, the Habib market, it's like re-entering the thing, but skim in, I'm not sure if, yeah. I'm, I, I'm not sure I, I am ready yeah. emotionally yeah. to yeah. be reassociated. Yeah. Am I onto something at all? <laughs> um, it's, no, no. 
there's it's it's about it's about compartmentalizing you know yeah i don't want to be known as a lebanese ta 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 yeah i want to be known as a ta 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 you know what i mean yeah so for me you know it's it was it wasn't um a very conscious decision to hide you know i've always been super open about it and actually one of our first uh one sheets when we sent out to and still today i think it was you know the best collaboration between a jew and an arab that yeah. ever existed in uh, music you know the most I mean? successful yeah the most successful Jewish collaboration, arab collaboration in history <laughs> That was written in 2007, still valid today, I guess. <laughs> But yeah. it wasn't a thing like I'm hiding and I don't know if I'm ready to reface my Lebanese-ness because it never went away. Yeah. Don't get this wrong, yeah, yeah. you know. And like I always tell, I'm I'm not here rediscovering my roots. A kid, though. You know, I'm yeah. like, I'm just refacing stuff that were hard to deal with for a very long time. Yeah, you know, that's what that's what I'm here for. But I never forgot anything, you know, um, and it was definitely not an intentional like hiding. Yeah, <clears throat> it was. I was always been open about it. I just don't find it necessary to tag and brand yourself as, you know, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It yeah. doesn't matter. Your your identity is your experience. It's not your blood or where you were born. Is not. You know what I mean? So. I didn't want, and it's. I didn't want it to be gimmicky. For me, this was really. It started, and it started very simply. It started by <clears throat> after the explosion uh, in Beirut, where I was just like, "This is." For me, it was a, a stark reminder that things haven't changed because I've I've been, you know, putting like. A lid on it for so long, and in my mind, I'm like, I, you know, I've given my childhood to the country, and I'll probably never get this back. But in my mind, this whole time, I'm like, it's not for me to return. I'm not ready. And I'm like, I have family here; they're doing okay. Things will go on. Life will go on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I had idealized the progress a little bit. Uh, I must say, and then when this hit, I was like, a ton of brick hit me, and I was like, "Whoa, yeah, things did not change, and this is my last chance to do something." And we put out a T-shirt with Chromio uh, for uh, f to send money to charity, and to my to my surprise, to our surprise, it worked out. You no, know, I. Did the logo with my own hands, and I put some time into it. I had so many different ideas. We chose one, and I'm like, okay, let's hope this works. Let's hope people care, you know, because intrinsically our fan base is not, and not, it, it's not Lebanese, it's not Arab, it's not, it's just, yeah. it's everything. And I'm like, who is gonna care about this? Nobody knows where Lebanon is on the map, you know? Yeah. Um, And it worked out. It worked. We raised ten thousand dollars. We sent it to you know a charity over here, and I was blown away by people's participation. Uh, and I was like, how how do we? But that's not a solution, you know. How do we keep going? How do we keep sending help? Because as you know, in the diaspora, I feel we have a duty to 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 do something. Yeah. Uh, with the means that we have. Right, so I'm like, how do I keep this a long-term solution rather than a one-off donation? That's probably not going to do much in the long term. It's going to help rebuild maybe a school, maybe send out 10,000 meals. You know, there's so many different ways to do it, but it's still temporary. Rebuilding it with sporadic donations is going to work, but how do we carry on? How do we change it, and how do we send help? And I was like, I want to start a, a company that will sell stuff and then send donations 
all of it. Yeah. So for somebody who doesn't know what your Habibi market is, what do you guys sell? Uh, it's clothing slash Karakib brand <laughs> to, uh, you know, that I and different people collaborate with different people. We design stuff, um, send money to charity. Of Some of it is charity, some of it is not. Some pro- Most products are fully 100% charity. Uh, a lot aren't because I have to keep the ball rolling and pay rent and, you know, yeah. I, I don't get rent for free in, in Los Angeles. So, um, so you know, I'm figuring out a little system where I can run this company, still keep going with my music career, uh, gather all of us in the diaspora who are lucky enough to do what we love doing, you know? How can we all work together and put some stuff out there, get some money back, and then send it back home and hopefully one day if this is a long-term enough thing where people are participating the, the, the customers decide yeah. you know you you decide if you buy into it or not and you're going to decide if this is going to carry on for the long term or not you know I, I can't go past that i can put my efforts into gathering people um presenting it in a certain way that it's going it, it's going to uh entice you to buy in and, and wear the clothes, but after that, you decide. You yeah. know what I mean? And and we'll see how, and it's been working. Um, but that was the goal behind it, and that's why I'm, I'm, I don't want to be the face of it. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. All right, let's listen to one last song. I wanted to play one of the more recent stuff, so I was going to play I Don't Need a, uh, a New Girl. Um, what do you think? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So this Good. came out a couple weeks ago, so let's hear it. Okay, so this song... As I'm listening to it, yeah. literally the first thing that comes to mind is like, oh, this would be such a fun song to sample and turn into a hip hop record. Yeah. Yeah. Please do it. No, but <laughs> somebody always, do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Like, do you ever, um, because you grew up on that culture of grabbing samples and chopping them up and, and yeah. reinventing them, how often do you do that with your own work? Oh, no, never. Never? No, no. With Chromio, it's it's strictly mus- music from scratch, musicianship. Yeah, because you also do creating, DJ. putting stuff together. Yeah, yeah. It, do you like doing that with other people's work? Um, no, we, most most of the stuff we do is is uh, yeah, all of it. It's really like the the art of composing and arranging is something I really love doing. Mm. When you get an idea in your head and you want to build it from scratch and figure out how to arrange the stuff. Is this what's going to be the bass part? What's going to be the guitar part? What's going to be the string part? How is it going to mesh together? You know, what do I switch? Do I revoice this to make it sound more like this? Or yeah, this is to me is the mental work that that I prefer. When you come up with a song like this, Mm -hmm. is your are you thinking of like the end user? Are you like, oh, this is going to be listened on headphones. This is going to be listened on AirPods. This is going to be listened in a gym. This is going to be listened to live. This is going to be listened to at a club. And uh, going to be playing like it's a, hopeful, hopefully all of them. All of them. <laughs> Are you optimizing for any of them? Any no. a specific one? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. It has to be in the gym. It has to be you know. Yeah. Walking to to work. It has to be, you know, wherever in the car. At the club, it has to be wherever. So I, w- I would say I maximize. We maximize music to make people dance, no matter where they are. Yeah. If they're preparing to go dance to a club and they're in front of the mirror, that's where I want you to play. You know, if if you're gonna move your hips while you're waiting in traffic and, you know, yeah, <laughs> annoyed about your day and you're just like, it makes you groove. That's 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 all I want. So it's primarily, in your mind, dance music? Dance music, yes. Okay. All right, before we wrap up, given that question, I want to ask, I'm going to put you on the spot. You have to think about it. That's totally fine. Yeah. But top five dance artists of all time that will invariably make you dance no matter what. Make you dance? Make you. Make me dance. Make you dance. Okay. Zap, Roger Troutman, Parliament Funkadelic, um... Midnight Star, Cameo, and 
I can't leave. Uh, the last one is hard. <laughs> you can give me more than five. Prince. Prince. Yeah. Prince. Yeah. Okay, so it's interesting. Some of those I don't know, actually. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's, so cool. that's the basis. <clears throat> so those are the raw ingredients. The raw ingredients. So that's like the, the chromio DNA. Yeah. That, well, my part of chromio yeah, DNA. Your part, your part is of chromio DNA. <clears throat> funk, boogie, early, 80, early to mid 80s, yeah. synth music, drum machines, uh, uh, synthesizer bass lines. Yeah. That's what made me. Is P Thug a, f a shout out to P Funk? No. No, that's actually another, it's a, it's a super hip hop name. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I know. I actually just... got this nickname from, it was a Mob Deep lyric mm. from back then. We were just like, you know, just do, do was listening to hip hop. And there was a, there was a Mob Deep lyric where a Prodigy calls himself P Thug Lee. And then somebody was like, oh, that's P, P Thug. That's you. I love it. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, we're going to do the quick Q&A and then we're going to wrap up. Yeah. What are you listening to these days? Uh, is it, like in these last days, a lot of <laughs> sentimental stuff. <laughs> French music, actually. You know what? Um, on the plane here, I was bumping Francis Cabrel on a loop. <laughs> from your childhood? Uh, yeah, yeah from, a chi yeah, from the childhood. I always loved Francis Cabrel. And, and French music always had like a special place in my heart yeah yeah uh, who would you love to shadow for a day past or present who would i love to shadow for a day past or present um my mother yeah in what year my mother in 1977 when you were born when i was born i would love to see what she had to go through because mm. we always speak about the man and my father and this and that yeah. But we never talk about the women. You know? Yeah. Why is that? Yeah. Cultural. Another problem. You yeah. know? What do you think people <clears throat> most misunderstand about your work? That it's nostalgia. Mm. Yeah. It's not nostalgia. I never lived those years. I wasn't I was here. Yeah. I didn't I didn't hear thriller firsthand. My first album was Michael Jackson Bad. You know, I wasn't here. Midnight Star had a you know number one hit, or Parliament was playing on the radio, or Zap was playing live shows. I wasn't here. <laughs> I was right here. So it's, it's not nostalgia. Yeah, it's not nostalgia. You're reclaiming the music you could have listened to in your childhood exactly, and you yeah. have been here. Yeah, you're re you're reliving your chi yeah. the childhood. I try to analyze that. Huh? <laughs> try to psychoanalyze that. Yeah. So it's like you're like <laughs> I never had this childhood. Yeah. Yeah. This was never offered to me. Yeah. I am going to have it now. Yeah. What if I lived here in 1982, right? Yeah. What if I, uh, here meaning like in America. Yeah. You know, what if this was my life? What if I didn't know all this shit? But what if? I mean, you've been yeah. doing it now 25 years, reliving those eight years. Yeah. Like, I want those eight years back. Yeah. I want them back. God yeah. damn it. Yeah. <laughs> So we've been doing it for 25 years and no, yeah. what happened? What are the answers? I'm curious. Still no answers. <laughs> you know, I just, this is, this is what I love. I'm, I'm, yeah. This is what I've dedicated my life to. Yeah. It's not nostalgia. It's my, it's my actual, it's my reality every day. Yeah. This is what I listen, still listen to today. It's not, it's not like something I used for references. It's not something. Yeah. You know? Uh, what artist from the past would be your dream collaborator? Roger Troutman. Yeah. Who is that for people who don't know, including me? People who don't know, we should play yeah. a Roger Troutman song in the background somewhere at yeah. some point. Let's do it. Tell me which one. Uh, Computer Love.
my life. Did you grow up on Stevie as well? Was he a big influence on you? No. I mean, grow up musically, not grow up no, as a kid. No, not really. I love Stevie Wonder, but it, the, apart from like technically learning chords and, and stuff from him, of course I love Stevie Wonder and I'll put an album yeah. and play it, uh, you know? But in terms of hard, like hard influence, no, no. Yeah. It was funk for me, really, just funk music. Straight up funk. Drums, synths, because it's aggressive. Yeah. It's aggressive and it still sounds modern. You play this today, this is still being sampled today. Yeah, for sure. It's also, the, the tempo is crazy good. It's so yeah. slow. Yeah. It's yeah. such a bass line. But even all their other songs and <laughs> all the funk stuff, it's aggressive. It's yeah. aggressive with a sheen of elegance. Yeah. You know? And <laughs> again, this is Lebanon. Yeah. Aggressive, always with a sheen of elegance. Yeah. You know? Always. Still today. Yeah. Yeah. P, uh, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. If anyone wants to <clears throat> connect, uh, go listen to Chromio. At Chromio, you can find Yeah uh, Habibi Market at Y H A uh, B I B Market. Yeah. Thanks, man. This was so much. Thank fun. you. Thank you. Thank you.